while, oh, let me, let me just, look, just look you over for a moment. That's enough, okay. Uh, you are a beautiful looking crowd today. And thank you, dear brother, for that exciting report. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do about that early church crowd. You know, we, we meet in here at 8 o'clock uh, on Sunday morning, and, and I, I don't wake up till 9.30. And the bigger problem is they don't either. <laughs> but but I'm, glad they're, I'm glad they're here, and it gives me an opportunity to practice my sermon. So... And now we have to uh, face uh, the inevitability of losing an hour of sleep next week. I don't, I don't like losing anything. When I become president, I'm going to pass a law that just does away with all of those time changes. I'm going to put together an exploratory committee, but you can, uh, you can send donations right away. Don't, don't wait on that. I uh, preached at 8 o'clock this morning, then I taught Sunday school with much vigor, and I'm preaching again, and I've got a birthday in a few days. I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> you know what? I couldn't do any of it. I Really, I couldn't do any of it without the Lord, and I can do all of it with the Lord. I sense His presence today, don't you? God is good, and we are blessed. Amen. Well, join me, if you would, please, as we turn in our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. Hey, guys, you sat through the first sermon. You don't have to sit through the second one. If, if you want to go out there and have coffee and relax and fellowship, I won't be offended at all. In fact, I'll join you. Let's, no, let's go. <laughs> Feel free. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. We're going to interrupt the paragraph, but I want to pick up with verse 14 where Paul says to Timothy, but as for you, in fact, he says that quite often uh, in his writing in 2 Timothy, uh, drawing a contrast between Timothy and, 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 and everyone else, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed. We're doing a series on, what is it, this is us, or, and this is us, this, this is our stand. This is what we believe. This is the underlying core and conviction of our heart that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Continue in chapter 4. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction, for the time will come, and I believe we're there, when men will not put up with sound doctrine, instead to suit their own desires. They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn the ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. All right, I lost my place. I'll find it in a moment. I'm looking for the word myths. There it is, verse 5. But you, again, but you, Timothy, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Now, Paul is writing to a young pastor. He's about my age, maybe a little younger. And he's telling him exactly what he needs to know 
in order to faithfully discharge all the duties of his ministry. And what he tells Timothy has practical and powerful implications for all of us. Yes, even us today. And that's what amazes me about the Word of God. That's part of the attraction and the beauty of it. Even though we are divided by centuries and cultures, by oceans and eons, it is amazingly relevant to us today. Any Christian who thinks that the serious consideration and contemplation of this Word is an irrelevant exercise is a clueless Christian and needs an awakening like yesterday. And that's why I'm here. Consider me your alarm clock today. And boy, alarm clocks can be so annoying, can't they? So I'm up for it. I'm good. I'm good at annoying. Every church, every Christian should be reminded of these words of Paul on a regular basis, especially in the day and hour in which we live. Paul so beautifully brings into focus the uniqueness of the Bible. And if somebody asks you, what did he preach about today? You tell them. He preached about the uniqueness of the Word of God. The Bible, the Word of God, is first of all unique in its origins. The Bible is the only book with divine origins, the only book whose source is God himself. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. He says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by, carried along by the Holy Spirit. And now notice how Paul describes the Scriptures. First of all, he declares in verse 15, the Bible is the Holy Scripture. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scripture. And throughout 2 Timothy, Paul refers to the Word of God in terms of endearment, and he talks about it being the gospel, this gospel, my gospel. The pattern of sound teaching, he calls it, sound doctrine, the message, the good deposit, God's Word, the truth, the word of truth, Scripture, Holy Scripture. Almost 20 times in this short letter, Paul references the Bible in one form or another. I guess you could say that the Apostle Paul was obsessed with the Bible. Is the Bible an obsession of yours? Oh, I, I know, I know we've got our obsessions Yes, sir, we've got our cell phones, don't we? Those pocket idols that we carry with us. And all the things we can do on Facebook, I mean on on phone, we we can do Facebook and we can do emails and we have our apps. And by the way, I have quite quite an expertise about this whole phone thing. You, You can text and you can tweet and you can Twitter. You can boomerang. (laughs) How do you like that one? Why, you you can even post on your story. Man, I'm good. And I have no idea what I'm talking about. (laughs) Thanks to Pastor Luke and Pastor Jack for providing me with with that information. But we just can't live without them. Well, actually... Actually, we can. Let me encourage you to turn off that phone once in a while. Turn it off for an hour or a day. And you know, there's actually a way you can do that, and Pastor Luke and Pastor Zach can help you with that. And when you do, why, it's all right. Don't worry. The world will continue to turn. It's got a creator holding it all together. And think of it. You can be free, and you can do something really interesting, like getting off of Facebook and getting your face in the book. (laughs) 
and there you might really meet some interesting people. Oh, come on now. People like Peter and Paul and James and John and Matthew and Moses and, and Joseph and Jesus. They're all there waiting for you. Well, I'm not against phones, not at all. I've got a smartphone. I, I have a dozen news apps on that phone. I, I like knowing what's going on in the world. I like being depressed. <laughs> but I have to be careful that I don't get so wrapped up in what's going on in the world that I lose my connection with the Word. You know, I think of those times and those places and those people who did not have Bibles. I recently finished reading Eric Metaxas' book, Martin Luther. Luther lived in an age when the common man did not have access to the Bible. In fact, had no idea what was in the Bible. The only thing they knew is what the church would tell them. Bibles were terribly expensive and extremely rare. The problem with that arrangement is that the church had its traditions and the Bible was largely forgotten. And the average layman had no idea what the Bible contained. And frankly, the church wanted to keep it that way. And today we are among history's most privileged people. We have immediate and easy access to the Scriptures. You can even... You can even have them put on that cell phone. Uh, and again, Pastor Zach and Pastor Luke will help you if you'd like to do that. Immediate access, readily available, and yet we sadly so often take this Bible for granted. When Luther got his hands on the Bible, he couldn't stop reading it. Metaxas notes his frenetic and passionate reading of it. Oh, I wish we all would discover the treasure at hand. I wish we all would be so obsessed, recognizing this book for what it is, Holy Scripture. Beyond that, in verse 16, Paul says, the Bible is God-breathed. Theonustus, God-spirited, God-breathed, God-expired. Oh, how silly the church must look trying to make the gospel more relevant as if somehow the gospel needed our help. Here we are trying to make up supposed inadequacies, inadequacies of the gospel. Because after all, it's just too anemic, you know, irrelevant unless it's injected with some vitamin us. So we can put on display our creativity and how our coolness. My friend, the problem is not that the gospel is weak and irrelevant, but our faith in the gospel has been wanting. It is God breathed. We don't need a new and improved gospel. Nothing wrong with the original. We just need to present it and trust it and get out of its way. Well, one lady agreed with me. <laughs> That's all I need to keep going on. You know, there are many things I appreciated by, about Billy Graham, who had his homecoming a few days ago. If you would have asked me as a young man what I most appreciated and admired about Billy Graham, I, I probably would have said his dynamic preaching. But as I've gotten older, not old, just older, it's really two other things. One is his humility. He was always just Billy, the country preacher. The limelight never got to him. And the second thing I most appreciated was his powerful persuasion that the Bible is in fact God's Word. Every sermon laced with the phrase, the Bible says. We need that conviction and confidence. The Bible is unique in its origin. 
Holy Scripture, God breathed. Secondly, the Bible is unique in its obligation. Now, Paul makes it clear to Timothy that we have obligations related to the sacred gift. First of all, let me tell you what they are. He says we should communicate the Word. We should communicate the Word. We teach it, we preach it, we share it. We communicate the Word, first of all, in the home. He says in chapter 3, verse 14, But as for you, continue in what you have learned. And where did he learn it? Well, we're going to see where he learned it in verse 15. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. And where did he learn them? Back in chapter 1, verse 5, I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives also in you. Yes, his mother, his grandmother, no doubt, communicated to him the truths of God's Word. And what a privilege and what a responsibility we have to enlighten our children about the Scriptures, to give them the Word of God and the Word of life. But not only in our home, but it must also be accompanied by communication in the church. There are three important verbs that Paul uses about Scriptures in the context of the church. Teach, preach, and read. And he sprinkles those three words throughout his letters to Timothy and Titus, but he uses all three of them in one verse. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. So we do not put the Bible out of man's reach. We do not shroud it or enshrine it as a religious relic only for the spiritually elite. We put it into man's hands, into man's hearts, and when it finds lodging there, man is changed. Character is formed. Destinies are altered. So we should communicate the Word of God. Secondly, my friend, we should be convinced of the Word. Look at verse 14. But as for you, continue. Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. That moment of conviction is what literally, truly, and fully revolutionized the ministry of Billy Graham. He struggled with, can I really believe the Bible? And he got to that point where he, in the, before the Lord, he said, Lord, I'm going to accept it all. I'm going to believe it all. I'm going to preach it all. And he said it revolutionized his life and his preaching and his ministry. And if you're not convinced the Bible is all that it claims to be, I would encourage you to do some homework. And if you'll do that homework, you will be convinced. Give the Bible your mind and your time, your hand and your heart, and the Spirit and the world will, will dis, the Word will dismantle all your doubts and build a belief system in you that men or devils cannot destroy. We should communicate the Word. We should be convinced of the Word. And then Paul says, we should continue in the Word, and I'm glad he said that. He said in verse 14, but as for you, continue in what you have learned. Now, that's an important word, easily glossed over, continue. There are some who have started with the word, but they did not continue with the word. They got off track. Yes, sir. They fell in love with their own ideas. Entire denominations have strayed from the scriptures. The word of man, man in all his glory and sophistication has overruled the word of God. And with the Bible displaced, a vacuum was left and then filled with new age notions and political agendas and made up myths. Why would you leave the truth, continue in the word, why would you leave the Holy Scripture? Continue in the Word. Why would you leave the God-breathed? Continue in the Word. 
The Bible is unique in its origin, unique in its obligation, and then thirdly, Paul reminds us that the Bible is unique in its objective in verse 15. He makes that objective oh so clear, succinctly stated, able to make you wise for salvation. Now we have what theologians call general revelation. That's God revealed in his creation. The Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Paul elaborates in Romans chapter 1. He says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. You can deduct God from his creation. You can do it cause and effect. You can do it by the argument of the intricacy of order in God's universe. And so his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. This general revelation reveals there is a God but it doesn't tell lost men how to get saved. And for that, we needed more. And we needed what those theologians call special revelation. And that's what we have in the Bible. The Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. How do I get saved? I look to the Scriptures and they show me the way, the only way. Aside from the Scriptures, I'm left to whatever passing fad and fancy is being communicated in today's world. So this wisdom of the Bible speaks of salvation. We need to hear from God in order to know how to be saved. If there's one thing we've proven, it's that we cannot come up with that answer on our own. We blow it every time. We will produce all kinds of answers except the right one. Man has all kinds of bright ideas about how to get to heaven, and he doesn't know a thing about it. Out of his darkened understanding and his depraved heart, he produces his own brand of religion with works and rituals and sacrifice and sacrifices and icons and idols and denominations and abominations. But the Bible cuts to the chase. The Bible will show you how to get saved. The Bible will show you how to get right with God. The Bible gives you God's wisdom so you can have his answer so you can know his way to salvation and what is that answer what is that way well the bible speaks of salvation but it also speaks of christ jesus in verse 15 how from inf infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in christ jesus I said Paul was obsessed with Scripture. He's also obsessed with the Savior. Christ Jesus is his message. And he makes that clear from the very beginning of this letter in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Verse 2, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. In verse 9, he talks about this grace was given us in Christ Jesus from the beginning of time. And in verse 10, it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus. In Paul's world, you cannot talk about salvation without talking about Christ Jesus. Not only Christ Jesus, but faith in Christ Jesus. So here it is, friends. You got two options, you and I, two options, trying to get to heaven. One is you can set out to work for it. 
strive, strain, sacrifice. Climb that ladder. Climb that ladder of personal goodness and achievement and sacrifice. Well, the problem is you never know if you've climbed high enough. You never know if your best efforts are sufficient. Problem is, you get to the top of the ladder and you discover it's leaning against the wrong building. It didn't take you to heaven after all. Because getting to heaven has never been about good works and sacrifice and effort. In fact, all of that, our best efforts, our righteousness, are as filthy rags in God's sight. Our answers are an insult to the God who has given His answer. No, not works. That's man's way. That's the world's answer. That's the world's wisdom. God's way. Paul's way. The Bible's way is faith in Christ Jesus. And with amazing consistency and congruency, Paul tells us that's the answer. There's just no book like this Bible. And there's no Savior like this Jesus. If the Bible is unique in its origin, unique in its obligations, unique in its objective, how should that impact us? How should it impact a sincere Christian? Well, I think Paul has told us we should communicate it, we should be convinced of it, we should continue in it. But how about the one who's not a Christian? If the Bible is all that, that it claims to be, how should that impact one who is not a Christian? Well, if the Bible is God-breathed, hear what it says. Heed what it says. The Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit and the Holy Bible always shine the light on the Lord Jesus Christ. They present Him to a world that is lost and undone without Him, a world without God, without Christ, and without hope. And they announce to that world, here he is. Here he is. Here's the Savior. Look to him. Trust him. He's the one this book talks about. Would you pray with me as we look to him in prayer this morning? Father, I thank you for all that you've given us. We have sung today. We have sung as the world could not sing. We have sung, we are blessed. We are blessed because we hold this book in our hands and we are privileged to treasure it in our hearts. We have this love letter given to us from God himself. And in this book, we have answers. We have answers that men can never provide we have answers, absolute and infallible. We have the Lord Jesus Christ who came into this world to save sinners. The Lord Jesus. And you said, believe on him and we would receive eternal life. The Lord Jesus, our Savior, who destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We thank you for the gift packages you have given us. We could never, we could never experience it all. But Lord, we thank you for the finite understanding that we have. We thank you that as we open the treasure of your word, we have revelation, truth, discovery, that changes a life for time 
and for eternity. And my friend, while your eyes are closed and your heads are bowed for a brief moment, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, if He's not your Lord and Savior, you know that. You know if He is or if He isn't. If you've not committed your life to Him, if you've not taken Him on as, as the Lord of your life, if you've not experienced the love and the peace and the joy that he brings into a life, well, I have the most incredible good news for you. The Bible says today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. There's no excuse that can keep God away from you. Only your excuse is to stay away from him. The Bible says if anyone comes to him, he will in no wise cast them out. God loves you so much. He's done everything that needs to be done in order to save your eternal soul. All you need to do is put your faith and your trust in that, to live in the light of that. And when you do that, when you open your heart to that glorious truth, I'm telling you supernatural things begin to happen. They'll happen right here on earth. They'll happen right here in your heart. God will send his Holy Spirit to live in you and to give you new power, new priorities, a new life. You can do that right now. Just say, Lord, come into my life. Wash away all my sins. You're big enough to do that. Make me a new creation in Christ. I want to follow him. Help me to do that. If you'd like to share that with someone or if you need additional help, any of us pastors are here to help you. You can stop at the Fresh Start Center on your way out that back door this morning. And there'll be people and materials there that will help you as well. Church, stand with me. Let's sing together this beautiful song. It invites us. It, in fact, it talks about Jesus inviting us. And maybe you'd like to come to the Lord because of a need in your life today. It may be your salvation, but it may be something, something else entirely. We don't want you to leave here today without receiving all that God has for you. One of the great blessings he's built into the body of Christ is that we pray for one another. And believe me, there's something about that. It just can't be duplicated aside from it. Pray one for another. Bear one another's burdens. If you have a need today, without hesitation, you come and let us pray with you and for you today.